Jan. Although, what is there to record? I think Pakistan owns Jan more than Jan owns Pakistan. <laughs> she has been to places you have not been to. Might never go. And where I have not been. With Aisha, she's been. With other people, she's been to places like the Wazir Khan Mosque, which has a certain separate section where coffees take place in the evening. And a little boy of 10 sings in a broken voice. Beautiful Sufi coffee. Gurlesha. That kind of thing. So that, and of course, Seven, and of course, which I go in, Vidsha. We've been to the two here, yeah. two main ones here. And I think she's more local than most of us. <laughs> and I hope without any further accidents to her hand, her arm, because last time she was a knee in Shimshal, mm -hmm. and a little stream that was like this, a little stream that was like a little boy peeing, uh, for best, lack of a better description, suddenly, the ice melt became so ferocious that first we saw mountains of glacier falling into the lake. Mountains of glacier, so hot, it was 40 degrees. And then the streams became torrents. And then the torrents became worse. And so when Jan tried to jump over one, the torrent caught her and she fell on her arm. And the arm got swollen like that. And that is now in recorded time. She got it on her thing and she might show it to you if she wants to. It's the most dangerous road in the world. Mm -hmm. There is no road on the planet Earth, not in the Andes, not anywhere else which is as dangerous as that road. Because it's this wide and it's got a drop of 2,000, 3,000 feet to the river underneath. And it's not metal or anything. It's just mud and gravel. So when it rains, it skips. And if you skip, you just topple 3,000 feet down. Mm -hmm. And that's where we went when she fell. And now she fell again and broke her. This last time it was ligaments, mm -hmm. this time it was bone. Mm -hmm. and, and ligaments, and, and ligaments. Mm -hmm. The same place. No, no, different hands. Different hands. I, I like to share things. <laughs> <laughs> and so now Michael, Sock, and Jan will go with me in August to varying heights of Nanapal. We have done 6,000. Jan was walking with me like that. Now Jan will hopefully walk like that. That's what's going to happen in August. So I'm very happy to see all of you here. And I'll maybe see you at the workshops. But I have to go and work. Till 10 minutes. So thank you. Thank you. So, it is really lovely to be here, and um, of course I was due to come out in March, if you remember, yeah. and um, I, I can't help but think that the program would have been, you know, so much different had, um, had I been able to do that, because I'm hoping uh, to do during this week, and, and then when I come back again, um, I'm hoping to do what I intended to do then, which was to help you bring the course together, uh, together with all those bits of paperwork and so on that you need to do for CPCAB. Um, so this evening, or today, may be a little bit structured, um, uh, but I'll try and make it as alive as it can be. You might have remembered when I when I did the Skype, I was trying to give you a sense of the different criteria that we have to do for CPCAB. Um, so what I hope, my, my aim is at the end of this week, one, you will be much, much clearer in terms of what you need to do to gather all your bits into the portfolio. And um, B, you will have had a really lovely journey in relation to the research project and presentation. So one of the things that, that we'll be working on this week will be looking at research and research from the perspective of, um, and we're, we're going to use big words here, but like phenomenology and research of, of self. Okay. Um, so it's very much about being a self-reflective practitioner. 
Um, and I also hope that you will kind of leave, um, uh, leave after this week with a good sense of peer supervision and also a good sense of what it means to work as an independent practitioner. Okay. Um, so our work um, on the level five for quite a bit of this week may be a bit businessy orientated. I think I'll bring alive more exciting things potentially in the workshops. <laughs> um, but it does feel like, like we need to do some of the um, some of the, the work of, you know around you know structuring what you what you what you've been learning and doing uh, in order to make you able to get the award from CPCAB. Yeah. Michael and I work very differently as you, as you know. Michael is very experiential, very in the moment, and there's huge rich learning in that, um, which isn't always consistent with something like CPCAB, who does insist that you capture it all and package it and demonstrate your learning. Um, I just happen to be reasonably good at doing that bit. So I'm pretty good at catching the work and looking at what you need to do in order to um, put your portfolio together. And I'm going to talk about what, what you will need to do. So hopefully, as I say, at the end of our time, you'll be on your way to really putting in the, um, the work that you need to do. So there'll be guided learning exercises. Um, there'll also be, you know, things set out for your research project that you need to do. Uh, and we'll also hopefully have a good idea of the different kinds of research that we use in the field. Okay, um, and that that are important. You know, for me personally, doing qualitative research is what I've spent a lot of time doing. Uh, and I'm really, in, you know, really um, a great advocate for practice-based research. In other words, that's the research that arises from the work that we do. I'll be talking more about this, I think, tomorrow. Rather than what researchers say say when they've done their research, you know, when they've done nine out of ten people said they preferred X, Y, and Z, and then we try to apply it to our work. This is working in quite an exciting way. We're saying that, that the work that you do in the field needs to inform the academy, if that makes sense. Yeah. That the work that you do in its unique format, you know, needs to be informing what we do as a profession. So that, that's what we'll be, we'll be looking at and unfolding. And I know that some of you have already had some ideas and I'll be really taking you through a process. Now that will be quite fun, I think, um, just allowing you to determine what your research project will be. Because okay. it's already here. Your research project is already here, even if it isn't fully known to you yet. Yeah. Um, we'll be really working with that. It's already here, it's just needing to come out. Okay. So can I just check, do you have with you um, the, uh, the um, criteria? You do agree with that's, that's grand, that's grand. Um, actually, he did in the... Um, uh, no, he didn't. Oh, he did, actually. Yeah. He did uh, so. Is this the one that was? No, it's no, the one the with... Um, Are you looking for this? That's the one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, I've got a copy. I just wondered whether you had... Um, it's the one with all the numbers uh -huh. and the numbers and words. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, can I, shall, I, shall I just put this into some perspective? Would that be helpful? Like, like what you've been doing um, and 
why CPCAB calls this level five, okay, as opposed to level four. Um, the work that, that we're going to be slowly building on um, is your work as an independent practitioner, as opposed to a level four practitioner, which is usually working at agency level. So an independent practitioner versus an agency practitioner. Um, Sorry, Jan, can you just speak up for this kind of I can, I can. I think it's the um, generator out there. It's, um, it's no, it made me jump earlier on this afternoon. I was kind of sitting there and suddenly went. <coughs> Take, take a few moments, even just for you to think about what's the difference in your, in your eyes between being an agency counsellor and an independent counsellor? Like, like what's, what's well, I think the main thing for me, it has been if I leave therapy work, I'm still connected, so I'm not completely independent. Mm -hmm. It's also not that all my clients are referred by Therapy Works, mm -hmm. but you always think that there will be a backup if you're running short, mm -hmm. there, will, there will be some clients coming that way mm -hmm. that they can forward to you. Mm -hmm. Plus also working in your own private place, I have a place connected to my house. Um, I don't see all my clients there because there's also that fear of not the unknown client coming in unless I streamline them in a way. Um, that that is a fear. Yeah. I'm thinking I maybe need um, need a flip chart. Shall I go and get a flip? Yeah, because because there's, there's you're you're already beginning to pull out some really good key key points there that we're going to be needing to look at. Um, <clears throat> but if we just if we just name some of them now, and I'll try and catch up with it. But <clears throat> you you named there maybe some differences in terms of how people get referred to you. Okay, so there's maybe we can notice some differences in the way in which clients come to us. Yeah, when we work in an agency. Often, um, somebody else may do the assessment of them, of the client, yeah, and then we'll pass them on to the to the counsellor within the agency, yeah. Whereas, if you're working in independent practice, um, the referral will be different in that you may be the one who has to make the assessment. Can you already see a difference there? Yeah. yeah. Something like that, what happens to us, if, like what Paris I was saying about uh, the rehab. Yeah. So yeah. they come to Ali, and Ali sort of screens them, gives them to Paris up, and he does the assessment, meets the family, yeah. but does the whole systemic yeah. and briefs us, and then we go in yeah. to see the client. Yeah. Whereas other clients that come to us are basically just pass on maybe to a client, giving a reference yeah. that way. And then we are the ones initially the first point of meeting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great. So, so there's something there around um, around who do, who who might do the referring, um, and uh, and how much assessment is done of a client. Yeah. So that's great. Um, I think also for me there. You know, when you're working with an agency, a lot of times the agency has an idea of what getting better means. Right. Well, cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause because there's too many good things coming up here. Um, I'm just going to bring it. I hope. <laughs> Is he looking? Is he going? Oh, I have a marker in it's, my bag. Is he a marker? Yes. It's the same guy who did the brush situation. <laughs> <laughs> I have a marker. The advantages of working in school. Yes. Yes. Great. Um, I may need to do... Um, 
my writing is not quite so good as it, as it could be. Um, so, um, so we're looking here at, at referrals. Yeah, we're noticing differences of referrals. When I also said referral, I also meant the fear of not having any. When you go completely solo. Okay. Well, let's let's make a note of that. Then, how how can we frame that? That like there's something about insecure. Yeah, it's also a lot more work. When your therapy is a business. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see another different different set of of ethics may come in here? Yeah. yeah. So so when therapy so that there's the, the, the referrals who how and so on does it um, you will begin to say something really important then oh, around yeah um, so i think it also kind of ties in with the business aspect mm -hmm. like um where what does it mean to be okay right a little mm -hmm. bit of an agenda um so for instance with the rehab it would be to get them off drugs to get yeah. them as functional mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I do counseling at a school and so there's a whole bunch of things of what it means to be okay yeah. there. Yeah. Actually, think about it, it's not the agency that is the rehab, mm -hmm. it's the family's agenda also. Of course. Yeah. Okay, still they don't, they're not comfortable with the yeah. plan coming out. Yeah. They're stuck in the rehab. Well, maybe maybe we'll put that in there because because the fam family and and you know family need will probably be there for both, won't it? Like, but but maybe what we can also notice um, here is support. Yeah, as an agency counsellor, chances are you've got you've got fallback. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe we're looking at the nature of support that might be different. Yeah. A legal mm -hmm. department. <laughs> Sorry. A legal yeah. department sometimes. Yeah. I yeah. have that in school okay. as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, well we could look at a, a whole bunch of. I think. I think there's something here, like that when we talk about the legal department. One of the things that I put as part of your criteria, if you look at unit one, it states very carefully in, in the main thing, in Pakistan, yeah, and very specific because it's very different here than say, you know, in the UK or the US, certainly the US where there's a lot more litigation. I stood in and I read the criteria, it kind of got me thinking about the contracting aspect of uh, me as an independent practitioner. Great, great. So, great. So, let me just write that down. Right. So, you would, so, did you have any thoughts on that? Other yes, than I did. It's definitely, because uh, I brought it into the mini group also and in Pakistan because the law is not so developed. Uh, as far as uh, suing a therapist is concerned, I haven't heard of anybody yet. Yeah. And I, you know, got a legal background. Mm -hmm. It happens, but it hasn't been developed like in uh, the Western world. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we contract verbally, yeah. and uh, our ethics are basically the boundaries that we try to yeah. abide by. Yeah. But after reading this criteria, I started contracting. Uh, a written uh, contract mm -hmm. and I was using therapy works guidelines yeah. and it kind of changed for me because um, I felt a responsibility to tell my client that they will have to sign this paper yeah. and I found uh, some of my clients a little hesitant. Yeah. They get a little intimidated uh, if you ask them to sign any document mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. there was a little shift in the way I was uh, approaching my clients yeah. because I felt now that, you know, because I feel better as an independent uh, mm -hmm. practitioner to uh, have some kind of a written documentation as a contract. So um, my way of uh, taking them through the 
initial contracting, making them understand that uh, they you know that part where the exactly if the police comes to us, uh, if uh, if we are asked by the police for some kind of information that the client has been involved in, we would be obliged to give it. So you know that was uh, something that they were a little. What kind of? <coughs> I said, if you don't commit a crime, there's going to be, yeah. I mean, a, a serious case, yeah. serious crime. Well, I think we can spend a lot of time with this one because I'm sure people are going <gasps> as, as they're hearing you, you know. And maybe there's a, there is a lot here in terms of, because actually, once you start to do to do this, like set up a contract and so on, you automatically impact on. The relationship, yeah. yeah, yeah, either consciously or unconsciously, it comes into the room, doesn't it? Yeah. But we'll we'll spend time really unpacking this. I have just one question here. Yeah. Are you also signing the contract or the I also signed. I yeah. signed, and then the client signs. Mm -hmm. It has both of the pages, and I give one copy to the client and one I give myself. I wonder how the maid cite the difference between, at least I think how it's practiced here. I think when we did our diploma, it was never taught to us actually mm -hmm. on a contract. Yeah. Now, since that time, we are teaching all the students that, yes, they need to have a contract. However, I'd also be indeed very interested to see what would be the difference a contract with, you know, under an agency or an individual contract. As that, I don't think right now is any any difference. An interesting and research I did. Yeah, but great. great. I mean, I mean, this is the, this is how the research I did. Yeah, yeah. Just it's kind of like, wow, that's interesting. You know, like. The, but we'll, we will spend some time with this because it is a complex area. You know, in the UK, it's a really complex area. This last year, um, we, in fact, this year, we, was it last year, it's whenever it was, um, we have all had to go through a process. Um, but actually, we were probably frightened into going into this process. There's probably a lot of fear for us around and when it comes to litigation and things. But, but in the UK, because of there's been the new Data Protection Act, you probably let yeah. that, whether that's impacted mm -hmm. on you. But like with the Data Protection Act, that's meant that all therapists have had to, to either be very explicit about the notes and things that you keep about a client. And, um, uh, and that, that makes a, a big impact on the contracting. I think we can work together to notice what, what is it that you do, because in the UK we have people on two ends of the spectrum. Yeah, those people who, who have made a lot of money running courses on telling people what they need to do so they don't fall foul of the law. Um, and actually other people who say, it's not a problem, I don't keep notes. I don't keep notes. Yeah, yeah, so one of our very famous uh, psychotherapists who's a great friend of Michael's, um, you know, Nick Totten, he's done a lot of work, he's a bit radical, but, but his position is, well, from what he could see was, you just have to be smart when you're emailing people. And you have to be smart. Smart when emailing people, yeah, like so you don't disclose anything. Um, you know, in your email, um, uh, in, in other words, that you don't identify people. Um, uh, but he says, look, the chances of that happening are so small of somebody complaining about that. And he said the only, the only people who would probably have an interest in complaining about that would be some celebrity. <laughs> and he said, you know, like, as I don't work with any celebrities, it doesn't impact on me. But, but there, it, it, I'm, I'm plopping this in because we, part of your work as an independent practitioner is to really grapple with these issues. You know, what does your practice look like? You know, what will your, what will the notes be that you keep look like? Yeah. How will you score them? 
these are the kind of things. If somebody broke into your house, heaven forbid, um, could they get your notes and then sell them to others? Yeah, and you know you're talking about the fact that the confidentiality and all. Mm -hmm. So yes, we don't have a legal system and maybe we don't have celebrities, mm -hmm. but our social structure right now, especially for therapy work right yeah. now, yeah. is that we somehow, this person knows that person and this person yeah. knows that person. Yeah. We tend to actually bump into each other socially because yeah. at the moment, at least we can speak for ourselves, that we are working with a very limited strata of people, yeah. social strata, and then they are all mingling. Yeah. You know? So, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that this is one special area that, that we can be really working mm -hmm. with around you know, how to manage your independent practice given you know, the kind of cultural, social, norms in Pakistan. That's why I put that one into your criteria, because you have to think differently. Don't you? you do have to think differently. And I think I think you've got some really important work to write about, um, you know, to the world out there. And you know, this, you know, the idea of, you know, one size fits all <laughs> just doesn't work. Culturally, when we look at working with issues of diversity, which is actually unit four, three in your um, in your criteria, you already have an issue to write about there, don't you? Around different different cultural and diversity things. Yeah. But the, this, you see how this just really plops into your independent practice, where you have to do the thinking about it. Yeah. You know, the agency may or may not have thought about it here yeah, at Therapy Works, but, but generally an agency is something that's responsible for that. Yeah. But now, now you're moving up to this level, these are the things that you need to be working with. Yeah. So brilliant. It's just throwing up a lot, isn't it? <laughs> so in terms of independent practitioner, what else might be here? I have a really time hearing it down. Yeah. Of the yeah. Uh, noisy, noisy generator. <laughs> okay. Um, is there something we need to do? Um, Maybe. Is is can the we pull up? Yeah. Can we move up the sofa? Or maybe I'll just sit there. Well, just, I, I could try and speak louder. Is that better? I'll just sit here otherwise, I'll be I'll be shouting. Yeah. I'll yeah. sit back. And you have the dog for four five days. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I shall just use my best acting voice. <laughs> that's better. I'm going to sit here too. So, so any any other differences that you're naming around being an independent practitioner and an agency practitioner? Sliding scale or something. I remember you said. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, after so many years of studying and you know finally getting the diploma, mm -hmm. I thought my day has come. So <laughs> 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 yeah. But then. Uh, in your Skype session, you, you spoke about uh, your sliding scale, and that made me very introspective. Mm -hmm. So I started uh, kind of looking into that if a student walks in, now I make it a point to ask if, if, if my fee structure is okay for her, mm -hmm. or I could just reduce it a little, and I do. Mm -hmm. so, well, let's let's put that here, like because things like it is really it is a really important one. I I do a sliding scale because of who I am, and also um, because it swings and roundabouts. It works. Yeah, yeah, it works. So I work in in the city of Bath, where um, you know it's a nice, wealthy city, and I also work with people who who have a lot of money and they pay me full price and when I give them the sliding scale they'll say no, 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 that's fine. Um, and where the other place where I work in Wiltshire, it's a much poorer town and, um, you know, and so therefore I uh, sometimes I even charge less than the bottom of my sliding scale depending on who it is. 
um, you know, in my actually in my practice in Bath, um, I work with an with an 82 year old man who was very depressed, and in fact his GP referred him to me. And for the last year, um, it has been almost a year, um, I've just been seeing him, and I don't charge him. Uh, we work together fortnightly, and that works out. I couldn't do it for everybody, um, but the, the important thing here is that I, I, make, I make that decision in relation to this as well. I couldn't do it if I, um, you know, if I didn't, if I didn't have others. Yeah. It's an interesting one, though. When we, we'll, we'll maybe talk about business, and you know, and again, the whole bunch of, of things that, that come with it which is actually you know sort of maybe <coughs> surrounding all of this as we as we will see um, is one word and that's ethics yeah the ethics of our practice will come into this yeah um, so maybe we can just really hold on to that as a you know you know as, as a thought you know, the ethics of my practice. You know, it could very well be that I could be, for example, just really business orientated. And I may not think about how many clients I work with, just get them in. Yeah, maybe work with eight, ten clients a day, um, you know, six days a week. You know, so you sure told very days. earlier on in our <laughs> practice, Jan, that you cannot see more than three clients in a day. You were told very early on. By the agency. <laughs> <laughs> By the agency, actually, Jamie. I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of putting that, that forward that actually, you know, there, there are ethics here, aren't there? That, uh, like, I may want to make a lot of money out of my business, um, but if I'm seeing 10 clients a day, six days a week, um, where are issues, and it comes into a framework of good practice, issues like self care. We maybe need to think about things like greed. I may not think twice about taking anybody else's claim from them. Do you know what I mean? I may, may make my practice competitive with others. Does that make sense? I mean, that may be all right, but, but you see, it can really in, impact on Now you're not having to think about that as an agency, uh, as an agency. So, so when I offer them a written contract for some of my clients, I give them, uh, I ask them to think about it, mm -hmm. and uh, if they feel comfortable, then they can come for the second session. Mm -hmm. They are not obliged. Yeah. So it's like uh, uh, the way I have uh, my relationship with my clients. Because I think shifted a little. Mm -hmm. That was the difference between you know, asking them to sign a contract and just a verbal contract where I, I spoke about the boundaries and the ethics of mm -hmm. therapy. And mm -hmm. so. But one of the things that, that's probably important with all of these things is that as, a, as an independent practitioner, what I'm also kind of questioning is who am I? Yeah. Who am I? What are, what are my values? Yeah. Uh, we could even think about what was I brought up to value? Can you see my story becomes really important? Yeah. Um, you know, like, like I was brought up in the north of England with a family, you know, that always had a principle of taking care of others. Yeah, that's what the family did. You know, my mother was a great example of if somebody didn't have anything uh, and if she could have something to spare, she could give it. Yeah, and that was just one of the principles. It was the principles of that that formed the NHS in the UK. This idea that those who are who are not so well off deserve to be good. Okay. Good. Okay. So 
that is something I used to have trouble with too, because that's my mother. He was like that, so when I had to charge and he yeah. the, you know, the price scale and whatever I'm going to charge them, he, there was always this conflict, you know, okay, am I sort of putting it money value? And then this voice would also say, I should spoke to my husband, is it because of the fact that you're taking care of me and I'm not yeah. needy with money, that's why his attitude is here. So there was a lot of struggle around me. Right. Right. Till um, one of my peers actually asked me that you have your expense, that you go for your own supervision, mm -hmm. you go for your own therapy and all the other things, and you have your expense, and then you pay for whatever space you're using. Mm -hmm. So you need to take out your expense. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of Yes, I'm also spending money, yeah. so there's a difference there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is brilliant. Can you see how my story impacts on one of these things? You know, even there to the extent, you know, where like I don't value my work. <laughs> yeah, potentially. Oh, well, do it for nothing. Yeah. I think, uh, for me also, another thing that I think is really important to clients cancel last minute mm -hmm. and even though I've explained to them that you you know if you cancel last minute mm -hmm. I have involved my day and my schedule and time mm -hmm. and you you know you <coughs> need to pay okay the first time I always let people just you know mm -hmm. like it's okay but you know please think about this because I also I'm giving you my time my that you know and it's valuable to me mm -hmm. and I like you to respect that yeah but I haven't really charged anyone yet. So that is my issue, okay. that I still have a hard time asking them to pay. Yeah, yeah. Now, here we have that old issue, again, around boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, that comes into that. Mm -hmm. You know, the boundaries of, of um, you know, the agreement. Yeah, out of like maybe 11 times that somebody has overall canceled, one client who yeah. was paid half. So you don't know, need to pay half if you're just doing it two hours or whatever. Um, so yeah, that is an issue that I have that I need to and I always feel bad and they make me feel bad and I get I start feeling bad for them. Yeah. So that is something that I know I need to get over. Mm -hmm. Something like you said, do I value my time? Yeah. Yeah. Well we can really, really talk about that because you know there is something around what it means as an independent practitioner um, you know to really begin to charge for your time and well, then we can maybe just notice what it touches on yeah for me Jan for the longest time now I, I just have this rule you cancel less than 24 hours yeah. you pay 50 yeah. percent and that's that okay great you know, I think I think whatever it is that we do, um, there's two things. One, if that's your contract, you try to stay with it, um, uh, or you work with the relationship with your client, you know, and, and work something out. But let's keep these things alive because this this is all of the stuff that you've never really had to think about. Yeah up until, you know, when you're at the coal face, so to speak, working with the material. Yeah. This is what it's like when your hands get dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other things that are, that kind of maybe become different? In the I, mean, I think for me, although it's not so much working at therapy works, but I also work, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. work as a school dancer. And I started the department two years ago, and I think there is a conflict there because I have a lot of resources and I can go in depth potentially with these kids. And then there is a part of me that questions if I should, given that I'm working at the school. Um, and so, and, and I think I've even spoken to Anita about this, about am I I'm trying to figure out my role in the agency and, and which skills I need to be employing in that role, mm -hmm. right? Like if I, if there is a kid am I, and they're coming to me, am I acting as a first responder or am I acting as their psychotherapist, mm -hmm. right? And, and if I see that there is a lot of work here and there's a lot of trauma here, mm -hmm. do I then, you know, do I then <laughs> can refer them to an 
another agency or if I can work with them, should I go that deep and then I have to go back to this? There's a lot of conflict that comes with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I supervise somebody who also works in a, in a school. And I think that's a very, very large conflict that in a situation or, and I think it's a very great difference, right? Or they come in for a short time, and I think it's the same as we have, right? If you look at, they come in for a certain amount of time, and then they're, you know, you've worked with them, and then they suddenly disappear, right? I think in the school situation, sometimes they come for two times, then they have an exam break or a study break, and they're gone, right? While they're really serious, for example,
support staff group, and if we have any issues or want to discuss, there's always somebody to call. But so far in level five in Islamabad, in the Islam of Islamabad, is we, it's very difficult. They don't want to meet up. Everybody has, every time, throw a date and time, and so many issues. And uh, I think after Michael left, he set out some uh, mini groups for Islamabad. I don't know over here, but I believe over here everybody needs a lot. We haven't met. Right. Okay. And three times, and I have initiated because when I saw the video, because I wasn't here for Michael, the first thing he said was peer supervision. Mm -hmm. And um, but if if people are not interested, then what do you do? Well, I think it's a question of ethics. I think it's a question of ethical practice, um, and you know maybe one of the things that, that we'll be doing and looking at as we structure this course, you know, like we're doing now, is naming the things that's important for professional practice. Yeah, it isn't. Well, it can be about you know having nice cups of tea together. Why not? Um, but it, it is about, you know, really setting it in and embedding it in, into your work. I think I've been quite direct, I think I am quite directive on that, you know, the, um, prescriptive. I think if you're working independently, peer supervision is, is a really essential feature of your practice, yeah. Um, but we'll, again, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of keep working with it. And maybe, maybe you need to set peer supervision up, you know, uh, and, it, and, uh, and you know, be able to evidence it. I think that's important. Yeah, in fact, you're going to have to evidence it, um, uh, you know, as part of your criteria. I remember in the supervision court we had a nice form mm -hmm. to, you know, to evidence it. Yeah. So I don't know if we can use a similar one just for yeah. now also. Yeah. We've got, I've got I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting some forms for you. In fact, there's, there's some uh, assignments already attached to, to what we've got at the um, time. Um, would it be taken as evidence if, when we are making uh, notes in our journals of our mini group meeting? That would be it. Or, you know, you could just, um, you know, like one form of evidence for a portfolio would be just like like uh, you know, a, a, a shared email that says that you know you all met at X time. Well, that the, 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 you just have evidence of it that like uh -huh. you know, or or you you know you write each other a confirmation. You know that, like yes. towards the end of the yes. course, we each, you know, that, that our group met <coughs> on these dates. <laughs> you know, in fact, I have, you know, every every um, every five years uh, in the UK, when I reaccredit UKCP, that's my member organisation. It's a complete and utter pain. I despise doing it, but it's requested that I give evidence of all the supervision I have. Okay. So that so and that evidence comes from, you know, different supervisors that I work with, um, with my peer supervisor supervision groups. You know, I have to have evidence that says Jan, you know, has been Jan and I have worked as in peer supervision for the last five years. We've done it by Skype you know, four to six weeks. That's one of my peer supervisions. That's a one-to-one. -one. With others, I'll gather in a group, and, you know, and you know, so those group members have to give me a slip of paper to say that I've done it. Uh, and if I've done specialized supervision, which I have done, you know, I like, I like doing supervision, I like working with people who who have an area that I don't know in, that's why you go and do it. Um, you know, I have to have a letter from them to say that I have that they worked with me from X time to X time and I did let's say fifteen sessions with them. Yeah. So all of those bits of paper have to be collated 
been given this several times. Yeah. Um, that's ethical practice. That's ethical practice, yeah. Um, uh, the supervision form that the therapy workers gave us when we were trying to get her level four, mm -hmm. um, is it the same form that you would be expecting or? No, I've, I've, I've given, I, in fact, you've got a copy, you should have a copy of it there. Uh, which is all it is is an actually um, ah this is one for your supervisor to give um, uh, and I, I've, I'm actually